Very happy to introduce the first three guests of our uh, actually first session of the third big chapter here of the marathon. Welcome Richard Ventros, Marcus de Sotoy, and Pedro Ferreira. Um, I'd like to say that a little bit like the city, which is the sort of catalyst of this marathon, it has a lot to do with organization, but also self-organization. And as often with kind of bigger or more complex exhibition or conferences, we believe a lot in this idea of not only to invite, but to invite, to invite. So in conversations with Richard Ventros, we actually uh, learned and found out about the work of Marcos de Soto and Pedro Ferreira. So we're very, very happy to have this extraordinary constellation um, here tonight. Before actually um, maybe uh, opening it, I wanted to start with um, a specific question to Richard. Um, and I'm actually incredibly thrilled that we can have this conversation tonight because really everything in relation to London for me started with meeting Richard Ventros, whom I met on my very, very first trip uh, to London. And uh, you Explain me London actually can, through your... You, what, uh, when was that? Um, I think it was 87 or 8 or okay. something like this. Before the war. It was before, <laughs> before I had started to organize exhibitions and then Richard was participating in my very first exhibition actually in the kitchen show. And at that time you explained to me London somehow, uh, which you, uh, as you still say, you said it a few days ago to the Times, is a city which you still don't understand, but you explained it to me uh, through actually your ongoing photographic research, making do and getting by. And I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about how this project started and where it stands now, and also how it changed in time. Um, I don't know how you describe uh, visual things verbally, except actually usually when you're talking, it, it, I hope it is quite verbal. Um, a visual, I meant. Um, I, I, I don't quite know how to say this, but I, I really dislike photography. And um, I think it's a very uh, feeble medium. Um, but it's, it's, we use it, and I don't suppose there's anybody here that hasn't taken a photograph. And uh, I'm not even quite sure how it came about that I did take some photographs, but I did. And I've always done it, uh, but I'm not a photographer. And they have a kind of, or I, it took me a long time to realize that they have a kind of subject matter. And that subject matter is... Um, a little bit like the top of this table. It's quite modest. It's how things get put down, how things get arranged, how we, how I've got my arse organized on this block. And over a long period, that turned into a kind of grammar or a syntax. But I'm talking about an amount of time which is longer than a lot of people's age in this space. I mean, maybe 30 years. And what's sort of odd to me is that w why would I go on doing that? Um, and I think it's probably a, a little bit of an illness. It might be a bit autistic. Um, but I do still do it. And they, I think they're always at the edge of, that they're at the edge of the really formal things that architects often intend cities to be. So they're the way that cities don't quite function or don't quite do what they're told to do or do something in a different way. And of course, cities don't do that. It's us, it's people. So it's about the way that things get bullied, knocked about, a little bit loved, a little bit loathed. Um, and it's probably the center of what I do. Is that a reasonable description? Yeah, I'd like to know more. I'm curious to know more how uh how does it uh, kind of change over time? Because it's a series which is ongoing, but it's been ongoing for such a long time. So it's a, at the same time, it's an archive, and it's also a, a piece. Well, it's, it, I can tell you how much it's not an archive, because <laughs> there are still slides 
and unfortunately people have those as digital images and then they send them to other people and say uh, this is available or you could buy this or you could publish this but then they ask me for the original one and I don't know where it is so it's not an archive in the sense that a lot of people here would run a very organized and you know beautifully um, categorized system I, I haven't mastered that yet and it's a bit late in my life to um, worry about it o over those uh, 30 years um, has what you have found changed in other words you you capture different things that exist uh, London has been famous for its informality and shapelessness mm -hmm. but I think it is uh, undergoing currently a kind of a, a rush to design uh, kind of almost a regime of organization uh, has that affected your work yes how uh, um, I can't do it <laughs> no I mean it's a very good point I think this is a city that uh, I we would have been students about the same time uh, extremely uh, loose um, I was gonna say irregular but kind of just lo lots of soft edges lots of things bumping into other things and it's somehow just working but always working in a very approximate way and now it's becoming a regulated city and uh, it's also becoming a really owned city that's yeah. Uh, the, the, the sense of it, the sense of the proprietorial, which is often them, not us, mm -hmm. which is a, 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 an emotional remark, is much stronger. So, actually, the sort of things I'm more likely to be drawn to are probably, um, they're probably more institutional. They're probably more the smell of how institutions can't quite function but try to mm -hmm. tr try to kind of keep their authority up so they I think they're less affectionate actually they might less affectionate yeah not necessarily crueler yet but I wouldn't be surprised if they went that way uh, uh, we, we had a, got a very interesting uh, conversation before with uh, a criminologist uh, about the policing of London and also the extent when you started maybe many of the things you captured were captured for the first time uh, and I think that currently London is so policed and, and also so ubiquitously uh, filmed uh, with CCTV um, does that affect your work because there's probably not a corner of London that you can photograph that isn't permanently recorded by other devices. Well, I would expand uh, that uh, into uh, something uh. else, which is that um, I really like my privacy. Um, I don't want to be recognized. Um, and as you get older, you know more people, so perhaps you meet more people who you know. Um, but I think being able to move around a city privately is a really special thing and I probably live in a city because I need that emotionally I don't want to be uh, I need my I need the comfort of friendship yeah. but I don't want to be constantly being stroked and I think that there's a sort of funny hybrid between uh, that sense that the city is is vigilant and that uh, there, there is less privacy less Somebody knows I'm here. And, I mean, I, had, I know where I had dinner and I know how I paid for it. Uh, and for sure, that means somebody could work out that I was here or not very far away. Um, other methods beside, I haven't made a telephone call this evening, but that would be another method. So all of those things that describe where I might be um, have somehow diminished my sense of, um, of being the lost child. The Maybe it would be great uh, uh, that we can um, uh, open it up now. And Richard, can you maybe, because I think nobody could give a better introduction to Marcos de Soto and Pedro Ferreira than you. Oh, I think other people could do it much better. Um, I, um, uh, 
I mean, there are lots of unsung people here tonight. Um, and I have uh, a set of friendships uh, that I think mostly goes back to a kind of cult called Art Angel. Um, and the, the, the cult of Art Angel seems to be that they're always, they always seem to be women, and uh, they always seem to be um, exceptionally interesting and generous personalities. Um, and two, particularly, who worked w with me um, three or four years ago was a woman called uh, Kathy Batista and another woman called Tracy Ferguson, who are both here tonight. And Kathy, I think, actually might explain why at least half this room is here, because she's been with everyone else joining things together. So she said, um, it's all getting a bit artsy. Um, do you know any scientists? And I, of course, being in the, the art tribe, had to say, um, oh, no, 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 I, I don't know any. And then an hour later, I thought, oh, actually, yes, I do. And of course, I don't actually think it is interesting to think of people as, you know, the man I know who does maths and the man I know who do, does astrophysics. Because it's like, that would be like a sort of horrible address book. Um, but I have a sort of growing friendship with this man who's called Pedro Ferreira, who's an astrophysicist. Um, and I don't even really know how we get on, but we do. We don't talk about astrophysics. And I don't know Marcus so well, but I, in fact, rather crudely, I think I said to Kathy, Marcus does good radio. Um, <laughs> and it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. You're amazingly articulate <laughs> when you're doing that stuff. And you're very unpatronizing and generous. And I have to say, really importantly, you're both quite funny. And I think uh, fun funny can, in English, of course, can go from weird to humorous. Well. Anyway, welcome. <laughs> I need a drink. Yeah, um, but but is, is there a way in which um, kind of ideas... I, I'm sorry, I don't... Know I'm Scott Lash. Lash. You're Scott. Oh, hi. That's nice. Yeah, I, um, I'm also curious that uh, your kind of early goldsmiths days, because I came here in, uh, at uh, the end of the 90s, uh, having just met John Thompson um, to, to teach at goldsmiths. But, come back to that lady later and, and perhaps what you saw in terms of the, the cityscape at that moment, um, which might have kind of, kind of worked in, into your work and how stuff might have, might have changed uh, now, um, well, 30 years down the line. Yeah. I, I, not, not to sort of spoil your question, but I think that actually what uh, some people here might not know Sorry. Yeah. Um, who John Thompson is, but John Thompson is, is an artist who... Um, I think aged 31 or 32, uh, became head of the fine art department at Goldsmiths in 1970 or 71. Mm -hmm. And he immediately uh, did an incredibly obvious thing, which was that he just employed about, I don't know, eight or nine people who were about 24 years old, and I was one of them. Well, apart from, I mean, that probably sounds rather odd now, but at the time it didn't seem like such an odd thing to do. It was a generous thing to do. It was an imaginative thing to do. And it was like, well, why don't you get some people to work in a school who don't know what they're doing, but are interested? And the point I was going to make was that that actually came out of John's um, social intelligence and his kind of generosity. And I think that's a fantastic quality and I think that if you get that in a school uh, you've got everything anyway so you know maybe maybe this is a school and um, I mean how boring to have everybody in an art school that to find out they all went to art school it's not interesting <laughs> so you know I, mean, I was trying, trying to think of, of ways in which kind of the sort of certain kinds of assumptions and maybe your work or your work um, has kind of Kind of cycled through 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 Richard's Richard's art, but let me maybe I just want to ask a question to to Marcus, um, which is probably completely off the wall uh, again. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I was really interested in your um, your your idea of, of your kind of sort of theory of prime numbers, you know. Um, and what I thought about prime numbers, and this is coming from a position of total ignorance, and I think somewhere in something I read on the web, uh, you cite Leibniz on something. 
and of course Leibniz, um, as distinct from Newton, right, um, really saw mathematics in terms of an ontology and not just controlling and running and this kind of thing, but also being, you know, which <clears throat> probably opens much more onto art than kind of straight Newton thing. The other thing about prime numbers is, um, I mean, uh, this, w what's less known is, of course, Leibniz was like Madonna. Well, I think Madonna left uh, the, the church now, was a uh, Kabbalist, you know. He was a Kabbalistic man uh, from the what, early, early, early 18th century. And well, the interesting thing there, of course, is that, <clears throat> and you might try to relate this as, I'm, an, I'm a, a, me, a non-believer, but whatever, was that um, prime numbers are, are all different to each other, you know, whereas... Um, non-prime numbers you can divide up and classify by where prime numbers aren't they remind you of kind of you know paradise you know with in the genesis you know which uh, Leibniz was obsessed by in which you know everybody is a different name right man is the naming animal everybody's different and then you get the fall and you get these horrible regulation you know classifications and stuff I wonder if you could elaborate on that a bit Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of numbers have their own different personalities, and as you uh, get to know them more and more, um, you like certain numbers more than others because of that quality. Uh, for example, uh, my favorite prime number is uh, number 17. Uh, 17 uh, is... Mine too. Oh, excellent. Well, there you go. Well, the, the reasons why 17 is my favorite prime number, um, well, firstly, um, Gauss, who is the great, um, uh, perhaps the greatest mathematician of all time, uh, one of the things which made him become a mathematician was his discovery um, as a child uh, of uh, a way to construct a 17-sided figure just using a straight line and a set of compasses. And uh, he, ent he started a mathematical diary um, with this discovery and um, it was sort of what drew him into mathematics and he always wanted that construction to be put on his gravestone and I went to Göttingen just recently and it isn't on there unfortunately so I felt like sort of uh, carving it in to, um, to uh, satisfy his wishes but um, 17 is also another wonderful prime where we seem to be surrounded by bugs at the moment I think this is a huge great big uh, attracting all the bugs in London to, um, uh, to, to the Serpentine Gallery um, well it's, it's 17, there's a fantastic little bug which lives in uh, the forest in North America, um, which uh, uh, I don't think has quite come here yet, but um, it, it has this very strange life cycle. It hides underground for 17 years, doing absolutely nothing. And then after 17 years, these cicadas emerge en masse into the forest, and they, they, they sing away. The sound of the forest is so loud that residents have to move out. And after six weeks, these cicadas all die, and the forest goes quiet again for another 17 years. So uh, this is beautiful. Nature has chosen 17 as its favorite prime number as well. And it's also the prime number that I play for in my football team out on the Hackney Marshes. And um, I persuaded the whole of my football team to change into prime numbers. And we got promoted um, uh, after we did that. So uh, primes are definitely my favorite numbers. For me. <laughs> That's a good answer. Uh, we had a um, discussion uh, earlier about uh, art as a form of knowledge. Uh, and that mm. seems to be a kind of very important uh, issue with artists, um, for understandable reasons, maybe. Um, although, why, why should it be important? But, but anyway, so, uh, do you have an opi opinion about that? About art as a form of knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or in any way comparable to your form of knowledge? Well, I think... I think that they're, they're very different. They're very different, and I'm not going to go into the differences. I'm actually going, going to go into the similarities. One of the things that I've realized over the last well, 10, 15 years of doing science is that a lot of the ways that we pursue knowledge in science is guided by, I don't want to use this word, but I'm going to use it anyway, aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the examples, I mean, one of the, one of the things that I've, I've found recently, I, I, what I work on is, is the fabric of space-time. And, and another way of putting it, and people don't normally put it this way, is I work on place, the notion of place, and how dynamic place is, and the life of place, and how place is more than just somewhere where you put things in. It has a life of its own, and you can describe its life and its evolution. And... The way that aesthetics, or the way that this kind of creative line 
has come into play is when Einstein, for example, constructed his theory of space-time. He writes down a set of equations which are, people like to use this word, elegant. They're very simple and elegant. And that has pervaded theoretical physics. That has pervaded physics, fundamental physics, over the 20th and the 21st century. So the, what I'm trying the, to... The elegance. The elegance. And we can discuss what this elegance means. And, and it's pro probably a very classical sense of elegance. But it is this kind of thinking, this, ki this way of thinking. This, it's, what, it's this kind of thinking that makes people make choices of what line of research to pursue in my field. So there is a kind of similarity. You do make a choice. You do make a choice. You choose a, an elegant route, not an ugly route. Um, so there is a similarity. Yeah, but I think the quote of Leibniz that you were referring to was actually uh, one that he, where he was comparing mathematics and music. And he said music is the uh, sensation of counting without realizing you're counting, yes. which I think is actually a very, uh, you know, a very simplistic view of the, the similarities. But I think, I, I mean, I listen to a lot of music when I do my mathematics, and um, it actually is that sense of, of aesthetics, I think, is very similar between mathematics and music. And having an aesthetic sense is really important for me in finding a route through uh, what can often be a complete mess. And one, one of the things that I've found is... I mean, one of, the th one of the things we do on a day to day is try to extend what people like Einstein have done. And different people have different ideas. And you pick something, you pick a model, a theory, something to work on, which, if you, if you abstract, if you step back, is probably as valid as, a, as any other theory. But you pick it for a reason which can be quite subjective. It's not, it should be based on how well it fits the natural world or some more basic. Objective principles, but, 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 but it's are not. You, are it's you saying that God is throwing dice? Um, no, I think this is this is different. This is the way that we do. This is the way that we do science. I think the way that we do science is much more subjective and driven by some personal direction, and much less this you know methodical building this edifice. And we know what the next step is. And it's, I mean, it's what Marcus is saying. You 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 cut a path. You find your own path, and you go through it. It might be the wrong path, but it's the path that you choose for your aesthetic judgment. Yeah, I think there are a lot more choices than people expect in a science, actually, that um, uh, you can choose many directions to go in. I mean, I, I often, I mean, mathematicians always love to talk of themselves as artists, kind of, rather than scientists, but, um, but I, I think there is a sort of a, um, it's an art, but an art under huge constraints. I mean, right. almost like building a building, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you, you want to build something, but it's got to stand up, but what can you do within that? Maybe a question to the three of you, which I thought could be interesting, is we've you know, talked about lots of different kind of models of contact zones between disciplines, that sort of idea of going beyond the fear of pooling knowledge. And um, Brian Eno, who started the marathon tonight, talked about his sort of very astonishing kind of art school out of which he came, where for some years really science and engineering and art, and it all sort of came together. Mm -hmm. And we've evoked many other such models over the last sort of hours. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk, because we are here in this situation of having a dialogue between art and science, um, how you feel uh, in your sort of own way you go beyond this fear of pooling knowledge within your dialogue between the three of you, but yeah, within your practice. You. Richard, two. Yeah. It's a question to the three of you, basically. It's the word pooling knowledge. Yeah, pooling use. knowledge and going beyond the fear of doing so. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was one of the th reasons that uh, Richard and I met, actually, was um, a project where uh, Richard kept a diary of what it was to be an artist for six months. And uh, two years later, uh, the Gulbenkian Foundation, which uh, sponsored that, asked nine scientists to keep diaries. And uh, we did an event together, two artists and two scientists. Uh, and that was really exciting for me, actually, to see um, the similarities and the big differences between what I do and what an artist does. I mean, uh, the person I really felt that I had most in common with uh, it was not actually the event we did at the Hay Festival, but another event at the Royal Society, was a novelist in that uh, book. The no, way no. he was... Was that Lawrence Norfolk? Yes, Lawrence Norfolk yeah. wrote this fantastic novel, uh, and it, you could just and he talked about it in the six months. And the way he was piecing together the narrative and the th way things didn't work, and then suddenly it all slotted into place, it felt like proving a theorem. I mean, my description in my diary of what it was to prove a theorem, which just you know, we suddenly said, "My gosh, we're doing the same thing almost here." So, uh, could can, can you 
both say something about the the relation of, of fear to desire, though. I mean, that, that what, all your gestures just now are all about the exhilaration of it fits, or yeah, you know. Yeah. But there's also it doesn't fit. Yeah. And the the sort of fuck it factor. The, the diary I kept, I was trying to prove this conjecture, and it was all about beauty. I had this beautiful, all the examples I had, had this beautiful palindromic symmetry. And I thought, wow, this has got to be true. You know, the symmetry is always there, always there. Uh, and I finished the diary, and I was still working on it. And then a few months after I finished the diary, a student, one of my graduate students, came into my office and showed me an example where the symmetry wasn't there. And it was like, oh my God, I've been trying to prove this thing for 10 years, and it, it, it's not as beautiful as I thought it was, you know. So, you know, it is, you have to take a lot of risks and be prepared to fail in order to have those one few times where it, where it does work out. But, um, but you have to be prepared for nature not always to be beautiful. But I, I don't know if you find this, but I've found that some of the projects which I've loved most are failed projects. Yeah. Some of the projects which are the ones that I really obsess about and I, I think I invested most of my intellectual and creative energy in are ones that didn't work. And then, you know, retrospect, it's obvious why they didn't work. While ones that have been incredibly successful and have had a lot of citations where, you know, they just happened. They just kind of fell yeah. out. Well, there's a richness and about things yeah. going wrong, actually, because then you have suddenly a complexity there that you didn't realize. And, and then you can say things that... What, something's like beautiful and something's ugly. You yeah. suddenly have a notion of beauty there because these things are working and these aren't. So that, that may be more interesting than everything working. Yeah. But my whole work is beginning to look as if it might be about things going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of disturbing, really, because you think, well, maybe this is a perpetual interest in the beauty of failure. Um, and I have a terrible eye for failure. I haven't found a good failure in here tonight, but the point is I don't yeah. look. It, but it, they visit me. Actually, yeah. the bugs are an amusing. They're like a little sort of woo. <laughs> but that, that, they're almost intimate, so they don't quite qualify. But there is a funny thing about the f that I'll always see the crack in the glass before I see the glass, always. It's actually a marvelous end point, I think, to end here with uh, failure as being something positive. Uh, Cedric Price used to say that uh, one of the key issues is that it has unfortunately become so difficult in Western society to make actually mistakes. And as we know from marking Yun and all our other Chinese friends, failure is positive in China. So many, many thanks uh, to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.